<laughs> are brutal. Yeah. Hey, everybody uh, who's who's joined us. It's good to have you guys with us tonight. I'm here with uh, John and Crystalline, and we've been chatting up a storm for like the last 20 minutes waiting to get um, get started. I am so happy to have them uh, here with us uh, tonight. I see several faces and names that I recognize. Dave, it's good to see you. I don't know if uh, Pat's there with you, but if she is, hi, Pat. And if she's not, make sure you say hi. See Jonda, Mary, Warwick, hi, Mary. Terry Sands. Hi, Terry. Terry. Heard, I haven't heard from you or seen you in a while. I hope you're doing, you and your family are doing well. Hi, Steve. Uh, haven't, haven't seen you for a bit either, Steve. Hope you're doing, hope you're doing well. Wendy, and I'm hoping that's Wendy and Bob. Miss you guys. Glad to see you guys um, are, uh, are with us. I see Norm. I see Celia. Celia, if you can hear me, you finally figured out Zoom. Yes, <laughs> we made it. <laughs> I'm so glad. And I see the Goebbels just joined, and I see Jonda. Uh, thanks all you guys for being here tonight. Um, one thing I forgot to do last week is uh, open in prayer, and so I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna open in prayer, and and then I'm gonna let uh, I'm gonna let Chris Lynn and John just introduce themselves a little bit before we get started. So um, would you guys just uh, join me uh, join me in prayer? Uh, Father, I, uh, I thank you for tonight, and I, I thank you for this opportunity just to chat about things that are on our hearts and on our minds. Lord, I've already just been encouraged spending uh, 15 minutes or so just chatting with Chris Lynn and John and talking about the world and talking about you and talking about life, and so I'm thankful for that, and I pray that the rest of this time would just be encouraging, Father, um, would be encouraging to everyone who's involved, Father, the things we talk about, Lord, it'd be insightful. Lord, send, uh, send your spirit to just move within each one of us, Father, not only just the ones talking, but also the ones listening, Father, that, um, that the spirit would just move and enlighten and illuminate things to each one of us, Father, as we talk through some, uh, through some big questions tonight, Father. So, Lord, I just thank you for, uh, for this time. Thank you for Chris and John's willingness to share and Lord, uh, we just dedicate this night to you and ask that uh, that your hand would be upon it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, I see a couple of other people joined. I see, uh, um, I just let somebody else in. Who was it? Now I can't see their name. Well, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, so I've got uh, I've got John and Chris Lynn Shepherd here, and I always spell their I always spell their name wrong. Um, but uh, Chris Lynn's first name is hard to spell, and then. Uh, and then your guys' last name is a unique spelling too for the word for shepherd, isn't it? A little bit. Yeah. yeah usually an H <laughs> so, after the P. Yeah. So when I, yeah, when I just write it down in my notes, you know, I don't really care if I spell it wrong, but if I have to write it officially, I always have to go look how to spell it so I don't <laughs> mess it up. But besides your name, uh, your names being a little bit unique, why don't you just tell us? Just spend a couple of minutes introducing yourself to maybe the people who don't know you and tell them uh, maybe the ministries that you guys are a part of at Woodlands. Okay. Ladies first. <laughs> Ladies first. Yes, I'm Chris Lynn, and um, we've been with Woodlands now for what a couple years. Mm -hmm. um, we um, we've been on the mountain here for about um, four years, I think. We were commuting down. We were connected with a church down the hill um, for many years, and so it was a really hard break for us. But you know, I just got really connected with Woodlands. I'm very happy with um, Woodlands and just all of the connections that I've made. And um, so I help Helen out in the women's ministry. Terry and I both do, um, and uh, and Aaron as well. And uh, I co-lead a Bible study on Wednesdays with Mary Warwick. And uh, yeah, that's about the extent of my involvement for right now. And I'm John Shepard, Kristen's husband. And uh, like she's already given you our time frames with uh, Woodland. I'm currently the head of the men's ministry and I do devotions with them. Well, I send them devotions every Friday and uh, we have uh, get togethers every three months and uh, been there, done that when it comes to leadership in other churches. And so I've been elder, I've been deacon, I've been head of youth ministries and blah, 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 all the way down the line, which is what we all have done. So, uh, kind of excited to go over these questions and be a part of this thing tonight and I just want to be the first to say that I miss all you guys mm. you know it's like I'm banging my head against the wall yeah and uh would love to get out and be a part uh, be, see everybody's faces especially you uh, Bob Mata who <laughs> <laughs> yeah 
Well, thanks for sharing that, guys. Um, hey, everybody who is uh, everybody who's watching right now, I uh, just want to give you a couple of uh, pieces of information um, as we're as we're talking along here. If you have any follow up questions or thoughts, um, if you're on your if you're on your computer, you can click the little chat box at the bottom and you can drop a question in there. I'll monitor that. If you got any follow up questions, um, we will we will definitely talk through those. And uh, I saw Jonda said hello to everyone already. And I think it'd be cool if you guys uh, opened up your chat box and said hi to each other too. So feel free to interact. That is one of the cool things about technology is we can interact that way. And, and I've noticed that even on Sundays when we've been doing uh, Facebook Live for our services, you guys have been interacting there. So that's a really cool thing. So feel free to open up that chat box, drop a question in and uh, say hi to everyone. So we've got a list of about six questions tonight. And, uh, and each one of us is gonna kind of share uh, on some of these different issues. Uh, but the but we're going to start with this uh, this first one. And it's a little bit of a long-winded question, and it might be a little bit of a long-winded answer. But I think it's a big one and a good one for us to discuss, given the the time that that we're living in right now. So here here's the first question: With fear growing rapidly, can you clear up the biblical origin of Satan and the role he holds in today's world? All the recent conspiracy theories of man's ability to plan and carry out all this with evil intentions to take over need to be addressed before fear further divides our community, our states, and our nations. Well, that was given to me. First thing I thought in my <laughs> brain was, uh, this is, sounds like a question for a thesis for a, for a doctorate degree at Biola College. And uh, it's, it's a tough one. Um, there's so many different ways you can go on this, but the important thing to know is Satan's real. He is for real. Uh, technically, he's a fallen angel, and he was opposing God, and he wanted to elevate himself above God. And uh, he was uh, thrown out of heaven. And uh, he is everything opposite of what our God is. And the cause of all the stuff that you see every day in our lives, not just political uh, distraught, but uh, abortion and uh, dividing people's politically destroyed marriages, drugs, pornography, removal of prayer from institutions, on and on and on. He's the forefront of this. He uses people. He manipulates people. When you're weak in spirit, you're weak in mind. That's the perfect situation that he wants. So, uh, Right now, we have such a chaotic world with uh, dictators causing problems with the uh, 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 radical Islamics uh, bombing and killing and doing all that type of stuff. It's just fear is rampant. And it's even, even in a small way within our own little churches, we, we listen to this and it, you get afraid of it. You get uh, have fear in your spirits and your life that uh, you have to deal with this every day of your life. And just the little things, fear of paying your bills, fear of, of uh, answering without anger, without hostility because of what's going on to your wives and your kids and so on and so forth. And all the devil wants to do is have an opening. If he has an opening, even in us, his biggest, biggest thrill in life is turning a Christian. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's it. Yeah. And we can't allow that, you know? Uh, so for us who feel stress, doubt, anger, the unknown, our direction under God, these are seeds that are there for the devil to start working on us and throwing things out. Just like he, in the uh, Garden of Eden, just when he, he tempted them with the apple, you know, with the fruit, uh, tempted Jesus on the mountaintop. He's always there trying to win the spiritual battle and he wants it for the bad side. Everything about him is not good. And it's very, very, very evil. Uh, I have a little uh, thing that I, I basically found because I have a new MacArthur uh, uh, Bible, and this is an excerpt from it. I'm going to read it. It's kind of it kind of puts it all in a nutshell. We know that we we know that we are of God, and then the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. First John five nineteen. Despite the existence of count, countless political, cultural, and social entities in the world, there are, are in reality only two realms. It is the comforting privilege of believers, in addition to having eternal life, answered prayer, and victory over sin, to know that they belong to God. Though they exist in the world, they are not part of it. John 15, 19, 17, 14. They are children of God, aliens and strangers, 1 Peter 2, 11, whose true citizenship is in heaven. 
On the other hand, the whole world, its politics, economics, education, entertainment, and above all, its religion lies in the power of the evil one, Satan. Mm. The evil world system is hostile to God and believers, John 15, 18 through 19. As John noted earlier in this epistle, it takes its cue from the ruler, Satan, the arch enemy of God and his people. Because the world is completely under Satan's influence, believers must avoid being contaminated by it. That's a good word. Mm -hmm. There is no middle ground, no third option. Everyone is part of God's kingdom or of Satan's. In the words of Jesus, he who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. Or as James scathingly declares, you adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes him an enemy of God. Two choices. But there is a way out. I'm kind of, kind of, kind of uh, have a play on words here. So I don't know how many of you people ever watch WWE or wrestling or anything like that. But let's just make believe we have a tag team wrestling match going on and you're in the ring with Satan and the world represented by another entity on the outside and your partners on the outside of the ring. When you're in trouble, you tag out and they jump in and take over the battle. So God is, uh, the devil is constantly whispering stuff in your ear saying, you can't beat me because of this. You can't win because of this. You're not a true Christian because of this. You're, you're, I'm going to take away your finances and, and see what you do then. See who you turn to then. And also you get beaten down and you're sitting there and you're, you're just starting to have this fear in your life and you go, okay, I got to tag out. I need some help here for a second. And you reach over and you tag your partner's hand. And as he enters through the ropes, he looks at you. He looks at you and gives you a smile and says, I've got this. And entering the ring is the Lord of Lord and the King of Kings mm -hmm. and your savior and your provider. And he gets in the ring with Satan and he just, he doesn't pin him and go one, two, three. He smites him, mm -hmm. sends him to where he belongs. Mm -hmm. And as we walk over to the middle of the ring for the victory, he raises our hands because we're the victorious ones because we chose Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And, and uh, that's awesome. So there, the, the ending of this thing, and then we can discuss it more and more, is every day when you go to pray for your day, whether you do it in the morning or do it at night, as you go into your prayer closet, whatever that might be, and you open the door, there's one suit hanging there. Put it on. It's the armor of God. When you go into battle, have that. When you got God and you got the armor of God, you are victorious. You don't have to live in fear. Psalm says, fear not, because I am there. John, great, great word. And uh, as a kid, I used to watch WWF. <laughs> <laughs> The Rock, Stone Cold Steve Austin, Hulk Hogan. <laughs> yep, yep, I but did too. The, the illustration is really, is really good because you're, you're standing in the corner. Not only is there words being whispered in your ears, but you're being told to fear your opponent in the other corner. And I think that that is really what's happening in the world today is that we're being told fear what, what is across from you, fear what you can see and fear and i think specifically when we're talking about this question i think it's derived out of the situation that we're living in right now you know we're supposed to fear going out our doors fear coming in contact with people oh, fear yeah. getting sick mm -hmm. and and i think we sh as christians we shouldn't live in we shouldn't live in fear but to get to the heart of this question you know john's absolutely right like not only is everything that is evil rooted from the evil one but so is so is fear and I, I think that's something we have to understand is that every time um every time that we every time that we have fear we have to know that that fear is not something that is of god that fear is something that satan the enemy is placing in us to stop us in our tracks because that's what fear does it stops us from being who we're being called to be, which is courageous men and women of God. Amen. Yes. Do you think, um, kind of putting you guys on the spot here, but do, would you say that like this sort of illness, this sort of sickness, this pandemic is something um, of the enemy? You know, I mean, I'm more of the type that, you know, I think that the enemy uses it. I don't think a virus was created by God because it's actually like a little machine. It's actually very interesting to study what a virus actually is. Um, it's, 
it's, um, yeah, I think that the enemy definitely uses this virus. It's um, been, um, it's just created such chaos and upheaval in our world, and that's his playground. Yeah, true. Yeah. You know, I, I, in the middle of the whole thing with people dying and everything, it just seemed like it was something that, <clears throat> that Satan would orchestrate the cause chaos in the world. Well, just the confusion too. Yeah, I don't. I think, like Crystal mm -hmm. said, you can't blame the virus, but you can blame Satan taking advantage of the virus and causing complete mm -hmm. chaos in the world. Yeah, right. I think that. I think that's a really. I think that's a really good point. Is Satan the the creator of this? No. Is he using it to cause chaos, to cause fear, to rip families apart? Uh, you know, abs absolutely, he is. And I think in one of the first weeks, we tackled the question of you know, why does God allow these, you know, these sorts of, these sorts of things? And that's a whole nother question to tackle. And maybe we'll even tackle it again, you know, in, in the future. But I think the, the bottom line is, is that we shouldn't, we shouldn't always look to the negative of the situation as negative as it can be. Like what we should be asking ourselves is not what I have to fear, not the heartache that this is causing me, not the problems that this, that this is bringing to my life, but what, what is it that, that God is teaching me or taking me through, you know, mm -hmm. on this journey? So yeah, good answers, guys. I appreciate you sharing yeah. that. Um, here, here's the second question. And I've been talking to people, I feel like almost every day about this question. Um, when and how are we going to start gathering as a body again? So when and how are we going to start gathering again? Um, you know, as we, as this has gone on longer and longer, this comes up in virtually every conversation I have. In fact, I think Chrislyn and John, I think we sat here and talked about it before we went live. Um, I mean, I just talked to everybody about this and um, uh, the question is direct and specific. And unfortunately, I can't give you a direct and specific answer. I can't give you a date yet, but I can tell you, I can tell you a few things. Number one, um, I have not talked to someone from our body that doesn't want to meet yet. Um, and, and that is encouraging to me. And that lights a fire under me that not only am I feeling a desire to meet back together, but that our people are too. So I'm encouraged by that, number one. Uh, number two, I think we're closer than we ever have been to gathering again in some, in some way. And, and so when you answer that question, how, I'll tell you this, when we start gathering in person again, it's not it's probably not even going to be inside of our building. It's probably going to be outside or it could potentially even be somewhere else. And so, you know, be prepared for that because I don't think that that rec center is going to be opened up for anybody's use um, uh, anytime in the, in, in the near future. And so then to give you the best answer I can as to when and how, um, uh, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you this, the, uh, the elder board met uh, in, in the month of April and we were, as a board, very pessimistic about when we were going to be able to gather together again. Um, and that was back in that was back in April. If you don't know who the elders are, the elders are a group of men and group of pastors who lead the church together as a board. Um, I get to make some day to day decisions, but the elders are the ones that rule and have the highest authority in the church. So if you guys, just to make sure everybody understands that, and I have a really solid group of five men that are extremely wise, filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, but very pessimistic back in April, but it, we just met last night. We just had a board meeting last night. And I want to tell you that, that, that the feeling in the room about meeting again together changed from pe pessimistic to optimistic, optimistic. And here's what we're weighing, just so that everyone knows what we're thinking. We want to be back together. We consider the church essential. We think we're just as essential as a bookstore or sporting goods or a gas station or anything like that. Like we strongly believe that. Here's the tension for us multiple places in the Bible, we are told to be obedient to the rules, the laws, and the authorities of the land. And, and to our elders' credit, and I'm going to say it's the other elders, not me, <laughs> but to their credit, they do not want to be rebellious to, to our rulers and our authorities and to scripture. And that is a credit to them. I'm younger, I'm less mature, and I'm more rebellious than they are. And so I'm glad to have such a good group of men that are steering the church right. But here's the good news. We are weighing meeting together again soon. Um, I, I have thrown out last night, and we have made no decision, but I threw out last night joining with another with a group of churches. There's a group of over a thousand churches in California 
that are trying to all open their doors back up on May 31st. I don't know if you've all have heard about that or not. Yeah, heard. Um, but uh, I don't know that it's gonna happen for us May 31st, but we are looking at that. We are praying about that. We met last night and we're gonna meet again next week to discuss it again. So it's coming sooner than later for those who feel feel like they um, feel safe to gather and would feel okay to gather. We're gonna practice social distancing. We're gonna ask family units to sit together and not and sit six feet apart from other family units. So we're gonna do all the things that we can but that, that just gives you guys an idea of, of timing. And May 31st is right around the corner. And even if we push it to sometime in June, you know, we're, we're talking about finally, not later than sooner, sooner than later. So that was a long-winded answer to say, I don't have a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> what, are, what, are guys, what are your guys' perspective on, on the church meeting again? Oh, I can't wait. I miss everybody so much. I mean, Zoom has been amazing. I love the fact that this has happened at a time of all times that we're in a time of technology that we can connect with one another on, on things like um, on Zoom. But there's nothing like face-to-face, -face, just right. worshiping together. Right. I miss everybody, and I miss all the ladies in my Bible study, too, so much. Terry uh, had mentioned that she was she was excited to have us all over for lunch, and we all got so over the top excited <laughs> just to go have lunch <laughs> in my house. Well, there's nothing better than lawn chairs and sitting outside in God's beautiful mm -hmm. forest yeah. and worshiping, yep. worshiping the Lord. So it's a simple setup, no tear down. You just pick your chairs up and go back to the car and. Just wherever we meet, we're going to have the yeah. beauty of the Lord surrounding us. And yeah. uh, what could be better? I'm glad you mentioned. I glad you. I'm glad you mentioned that, John, because you know we 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 ask questions about why would God allow this? Why is this happening? What is what is God trying to tell us? But you know, just just in a small way, the timing of this is excellent for Woodlands mm -hmm. Church in the sense that guess what? The weather is beautiful outside. We live on a mountain in the forest. Like we might, we might get to worship outside together for the rest of the summer. I oh, mean, that's, I mean that yeah. that is that is a really cool thing. And so, just I, I just want to encourage people. It's it's really easy to focus on the big things that are happening on our world, but man, look at the other little things that are that are lining up that God that God is doing just to remind us that He's you know, that he's totally in control and totally good. So yeah, I am, I'm looking forward to that in it. And it, you know, if we end up meeting outside, you know, without all the frills that we normally have of inside, I think there's just something beautiful about that. It reminds me of the, it reminds me of the old stories of the, of, of the days of revival when the preachers would ride horseback from town to town and they'd have revivals and fields and stuff like how, I mean, just how cool could it be for us to do that for a season of time? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. It would be yeah. awesome. Yeah. So here's, a, here's the next question. Oh, you know what? Before I do that, I want to say hi to a couple of people. I've seen a, a few other people join as we've been going. I see uh, Daniel and Jennifer Burden. Hey, guys. Uh, happy to have you guys back. They, were, they went and saw some family uh, over the last couple of weeks. And so I hope you guys had a great, hope you guys had a great trip and a great um, vacation. Tom and Sandy, um, how's it going? Good to see you guys. Glad you guys are here with us. I saw Jackie join. Hope you and your husband are doing good, Jackie. Glad to have you back too. I think you guys were traveling um, for a bit too. So glad to have you guys here and, and, and uh, who joined us. And we're just on our third question of, of six and, and uh, we're going to go till about 830. We won't go much past 830. If we don't make it to the sixth question, we'll push it to next week. But here, here's the next question. We've kind of, uh, we've kind of talked about this a little bit and uh, it's a little bit of a uh, conflicting question um, right now uh, that, that, uh, what should we do or what should we not do? And so here's the question. Um, should I wear a mask in public now, even though it is not required? Hi. You know, I really, really, really do not like face masks. They, they make me feel like I can't breathe. And there's something really weird about just going to the store and not seeing people smile. I think that that is just very odd. Um, but, you know, I just out of curiosity, I went online to um, the, the county of San Bernardino. I wanted to see what people were saying about this decision. And to my surprise, it was very negative. People were saying this is a mistake. And I don't know if it's a mistake or not. I mean, the thing is, is that 
you know, research has shown that like 25% of people who are asymptomatic, they're shedding the virus. And I mean, I mean, me being a retired nurse, I remember taking, you know, classes and seeing like a close up of exactly what comes out of your mouth when you even talk. It's incredible. It's like this, you have this droplet thing going on that um, we can't see really with our eyes. And so I can totally understand why it would be important for us to wear masks to protect other people, especially like if you're just even passing and saying hello, there's stuff coming out of your mouth. Um, you know, not to be paranoid or anything, but I wouldn't want to give this to anybody. Um, I, you know, I don't feel like I'm one. <laughs> I don't feel like I, I'm one to get this. I haven't put myself in any kind of situations. But, you know, I think that even though it's not required, I think for, just for the sake of others and just for the sake of um, just uh, respect, I see that a lot of people are wearing them. And so I'm going to continue wearing a face mask when I go, especially to the store or to the bank. And I have a dental appointment next week and they are requiring a, a face mask there. Um, so I don't have any problem with that. I don't really go out that much. Um, you know, as far as outdoors, I haven't really been wearing a face mask around the lake up here. Um, they caught you though. They did catch me. There was about two weeks ago, there was an ALA member um, up here in Lake Arrowhead saying that uh, you need to be wearing a mask. And so she was pretty, she was nice and stuff. And we just kind of chatted a little bit. And then I ended up calling John and he drove down and he gave me a mask. <laughs> but it was no big deal. Um, but since then, I mean, I see people on the lake all the time without a mask. And I'm not really worried about being outdoors, getting this. It's more like rebreathing air, being in an elevator, things like that. So in answer to that question, I think that until this is more under control and we're just really seeing the tail end of it, I think I'm probably gonna continue wearing a mask. I just need to find one that I can wear that's not too uncomfortable. So I don't feel like I have claustrophobia. Well, um, I've talked about this a little bit and I'm gonna, you're going to get some um, brutal honesty from uh, from Daniel because Daniel is a human being. Mm -hmm. um, I hate wearing I hate wearing masks and not just for the uncomfortable um, feeling of it. I don't like being told what to do. Yeah. <laughs> and so um, I the moment I've been ranting about wearing a mask from the beginning, and the moment that San Bernardino County said we no longer have to wear them, I said I'm not wearing them again. And if my wife could talk right now. She would tell you that I've just been talking up and down about it, how I'm not wearing it and I can't believe other people are wearing it. And we're going to set the, we're going to set the tone that we don't have to wear them. And, and, and then I got to thinking about this. Um, and you might've even seen a little Facebook video I put out. If some of you saw that, mm -hmm. um, to kind of just talk to Crestline about it. You know, I, I got to thinking about this in a, in a biblical way. And, and I remember, I remember something a, a, a pastor I very much look up to said one time, in fact, John Brody gave me a hard time about this a week or two ago. My favorite pastor, Francis Chan, you know, said, said one time during a message I was listening to, he said, what's the most loving thing you can do for your neighbor right now? And that thought was just placed in my head. And then I, uh, obviously I started thinking about scripture and love what the first and second greatest commandment, love the Lord your God, love your neighbor. Um, and then I quoted that scripture from Galatians about freedom, freedom in Christ, the freedom that we can exercise to, to live in Christ and to, and, and to dis defeat sin in our lives. But the passage says, don't use your freedom um, if it injures someone else, you know, use your freedom only in love. And so that was convicting that was convicting to me. And then I think it was even just this morning in the car, you know, Aaron, uh, we were driving down to Redlands to do a couple of errands and Aaron said, so what you're doing and what you said on that video are two different things. And I said, yeah, that's true. And she said, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm still sorting it out in my heart, to be honest with you. You know, like I want to exercise my freedom not to wear it, but then I do, I do love our mountain and I love the people of Crestline. And my, my heart tells me that if people in the grocery store or the post office are wearing one and, 
it matters to them that I should probably I should probably continue doing it, particularly as um, particularly as a pastor in our community. And so that's that's kind of where I'm at with it. But it is a it's a genuine lush wrestling in my heart because I want to be free from it, but I also want to do what's right for our people. So, yeah. what do, what do you think, John? Well, I wear one, so yeah. um, I my whole philosophy about the other is not me; it's them. Mm-hmm. That's that's all I care about. So uh, I see people walking into the post office constantly without one on, and I I put one on as soon as I get out of the car, and mm-hmm. then I go to the grocery store, and I still have it on. I can't read anything on the shelves because it bogs up my glasses, and mm-hmm. so it's like it's a pain. But I'm doing it out of respect for the other people, like you. You're a pastor. People will look at you in a store or something like that and say, "Why isn't Why isn't he wearing one? He's a pastor." What, yeah kind of example is that being set we all have that we all have to set examples you know and uh, so I wear one I had carry one on each car and I got to go down tomorrow to pick up a window for my shed and at uh, tough shed and the woman on the phone said make sure you wear a mask when you come in the office mm-hmm. you know the yeah. thing here's the deal though I mean a mask especially these cloth masks I think that they do decrease the droplet load, the viral load, if you have a virus. But, um, and I, you know, research does show that it's effective and stuff. But, you know, I can't stress enough that, that your mouth and your nose is, is not the only portal of entry for a virus. It goes, you, if it's, you should be probably wearing face like goggles if you really want to be fully protected in gloves. Um, but the thing is, is that, I mean, we just can't be, we can't be rubbing our eyes, you know, and we have to be washing our hands and keep our hands off of our face. And, um, I think that that's probably the most, more important than wearing a face mask. I get appreciate that. Time. Appreciate yeah. that insight, Chrislyn, from, yeah. from the, from a medical perspective. Were you going to say something, John? No. No. Okay. <laughs> Um, I just want to say hi to a couple of other people. I saw Jeremy uh, join, Jeremy Runyon, and I'm going to think that maybe his wife, Christina, is with him and just want to say hi. I also saw Teresa jump on. Hi, Teresa. Hope you're doing well. Glad you're here with us. I don't know if I said hi to Norm. Hi, Norm. Uh, I, you were one of the first to jump on, but uh, if Helen's with you, tell her hi too uh, for us. So I just want to say hi to those couple of people. Uh, here's the next question, um, and this one's kind of a, a, a hands on practical question. Um, my income is way down. Can you give us some practical advice on managing finances during this time? Given to the banker. Uh, <laughs> you know, this, this is a really powerful question to me because you think with my background being a VP in banking that I could have all the answers to this, but three times during the times of Crystal and I have been together, I've lost all my income for my company. Uh, for many, many months and had nothing coming in. And then it's like practice what you preach type of thing. The first one was tough for me and I was scrambling around trying to figure out what I was going to do and wasn't giving it to God. And as time goes on, you start to understand that God is maybe using this as a situation to have him, you come to him and and, uh, uh, say, hey, you know, I made promises, come to me, ask me, you know. Uh, so now when, like, I haven't had any income for the last 60 days, uh, because my, or yeah, 60 days, because my, well, all my companies have closed their doors and the banks are closed, so I can't find anything. So, uh, and I haven't worried about it. You know, I've given it to God and said, you know, when it's time to turn it around, you'll turn it around. And in the meantime, you'll, I know that you'll provide and, and uh, we've been fine. And, uh, but to set up some sort of a budget, you've got two, two scenarios. You have somebody that's having to deal with a lesser income, and then you have somebody that's lost their job and has no income. So how do you set up a budget for somebody that's lost their job and has no income? Mm-hmm. Very hard to do. Well, the first thing you gotta do is you gotta sit down and pray about your finances and give it to God. Mm-hmm. Most important, if you're married, the two of you sit down together in joint prayer and give it to God. And then you've gotta walk the walk. You just can't talk to talk. You basically got to have that attitude because when you have a positive attitude, positive things will happen. When you have a negative attitude, negative things and fear will happen. So 
That's the first thing you have to do is give it to the Lord. And no matter whether you're single, whatever your money situation is, if you have a savings account, whatever, uh, you need to prepare a budget. And that's something that has to be adhered to religiously using that word. You cannot adhere away from the budget. You cannot let impulse overcome you. Like your husband coming out and said, oh, I, just, I needed those tools. And he's not a mechanic and he's not, he just wanted them or wanted a chainsaw or whatever. You can't do that. You basically, everything is for your family. Everything is to feed your family and take care of your family. And you need to basically make whatever income you have, whatever budget that you and your wife or yourself have come up with, you need to adhere to it. And you know, you got to understand you're not alone. There's friends out there, there's situation. You need to let people know you're struggling so that they can pray for you. They're going to hold you up. If you need groceries, there's people out there that'll be taking groceries to you or meals or whatever the situation. Don't be so proud that you cannot open up your heart and your mind to the people that are around you. We're family, you know? The church is a family. And we need to help each other and be there for each other. Uh, so reach out. If you, if you need prayer, Chris and I'll pray for you or talk to you. Daniel, Aaron, the elders, if you belong to a discipleship group, the people in the discipleship group, your Bible studies, your couples groups, uh, you, can, you can send something into the website. If the church was open, you'd be handing out cards and you'd be writing out cards. You need to let others know about your plight. You need to, and so don't be so proud that oh, I lost my job. I mean, West last week had it, he must have said it five times. Yep, I lost my job five or six times in the last, and uh, it's just another time. And you can tell the guy just gives it to the Lord, you know, and just, and that's the type of attitude you have to have. Mm -hmm. You can't be down. Uh, it's not, like I said, it's not a sin to ask for help. You know, there are sources, government sources out there that are also available. To those if you've worked you made an income you paid in there's situations that you can go and apply for and get financial aid don't be too proud if it's available it's legitimate it's not a sin to go ask for it that's what i feel so and i said say at the end just stay in prayer pride greed excess are all sins and can be destroy you financially just stay in prayer ask for prayer and just give it to god and god will take care of you too that um that this is would be an opportunity for people in our church that are gifted with um you know financial matters like setting a budget or teaching that or helping one another i think that it, it's a good opportunity for um for those that are gifted in that area to come alongside someone else who really needs some help in that area um yeah, I think that that I, myself personally, I I suck at at um, at <laughs> financial. I just <laughs> take care of it, <laughs> <laughs> figure it out. But oh, you know, being an ex landlord, uh, I used to have my renters call me up and say, "I'm really struggling right now." Can blah 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 blah. You know. If you're honest, they would rather hear from you saying, I can't make the payment right now, yeah. than you not make the payment and not talk to them. That's the worst thing you can do. So honesty prevails. You know, uh, Always be honest in a situation with your friends, your family, and the church, your family members. You know, They're there too. Mm -hmm. Reach out to them if you need to. This is a very trying situation for a lot, a lot of people out there. And you've got to basically know that your family loves you. Your family in the church loves you. And uh, we got to be there for everybody. Yeah, I, I appreciate all your guys' your thoughts. And uh, Terry asked a question. She said, are there any needs in our church currently? And uh, let, me, let me say this to just kind of, uh, kind of address this. Um, there have been a few needs in our church, but overwhelmingly there's been more people willing to fulfill needs than there has been needs. And so just to address this, if you're out there, this has already been said over and over, if you're out there and you need help, yes. you, need to, you need to get in contact with us and let us know so that we can pair you with someone who wants, who wants to help and is still in a good place that they can help others. And so um, I love that we have more people 
willing to help than are in need, but I actually have a feeling that there's a lot of people in need who just aren't speaking up. And so just feel free to, feel free to speak up and Terry to, Terry to answer your question directly. I'll put you on, I'll put you on the list. And what I've been kind of doing is needs have come out and it hasn't been super frequent, but I've just been sending an email out to the people who've been offering and, and anybody who can jump in and help um, has been, has been doing, has been doing that. So I appreciate that. Uh, that offer, Terry, and and I think what's been said here is is uh, is really good. Um, uh, John mentioned something that I think is a practical question to answer. He he asked about, or he he talked about um, he talked about resources like from the government, whether it whether it be unemployment or or whatever it whatever it might be. And I I, I really actually agree with with John. I think that. If you if you're genuinely in need and you genuinely um, genuinely need assistance and help, I think you should use those resources. And I would just say this: I don't think it's right for a believer to abuse it. Right. And so my what I would say to anyone in a situation where they've lost a job and they need help, go go get the help that you need, while at the same time you you should be the way I think you honor God in that is by getting out and getting a job as quickly, as quickly as possible, as quickly as possible. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't encourage anyone to, to take, to take uh, unemployment and make it an extended vacation. I don't think that that's the right thing to do as a, as a, as a believer. I think God is very clear about believers being hard workers and and working for working for their wage and and earning and setting a good example for others and so I, I don't think you should hesitate to use the assistance as needed but i think you should be very very careful not to not to abuse it amen yeah yeah uh hey here's the uh here's the next question um is there a biblical reference or story that parallels the COVID 19 crisis uh, if so, what happens? And I'm gonna I'm gonna jump on um, I'm gonna jump on this question first, and then if John and Chrislyn want to share about it, they're they're welcome too. And I'm gonna I'm gonna just offer two two stories. The first one is the story that we've been talking through on on Sunday mornings, um, the story of the Israelites. I go go back about a month uh, to the to the plagues. I I, uh, I think I think. Uh, the plagues were far worse than what we're experiencing, at least in a in a in the small environment of of Egypt. But what I would say is, look at look at what happens to that in that story during the plagues. The plagues were awful. It was terrible for the Egyptians. People got sick. People died. There wasn't food. There wasn't water. Go you know go on and on and on. That, that's what was happening during the plagues. But what what did God do during the plagues? He took care of his people. He watched out for his people, and he even used the plagues for the for the good of of the people, and 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 then he takes them on this journey of leading them to the promised land, and and I would say just we should be looking at it from that sort of from that sort of perspective. Um, we are in this moment of a pandemic. We're in this moment of sickness, no matter how, if you feel like the numbers are overblown or underblown or however you feel about it, you know, I think that God is going to watch out for his people, protect his people and lead them and lead them to a, to a, a better place on, on the other side of this. And so that's the first story that comes to mind. And the second story that came to mind as I was thinking this question through um, earlier today is just uh, is a, a series of stories in Jesus's life that come from, that come from Matthew 9. I mean, Matthew 9 is an entire chapter dedicated to Jesus healing people. He, heal, he heals a, a paralyzed, um, he heals a paralyzed man. He heals uh, a daughter of someone who is sick. He heals a woman who is suffering from, um, from bleeding. He, he heals a ruler's daughter that was dead. It goes on and on and on and on and on. And then at the very end, uh, Jesus, Jesus gets to the end of this, this chapter, the end of this story. And he looks around at all the people because he's healed so many through all of these stories, but he looks around at all of the people. And, and he says in the Bible says that he was moved to compassion and he pitied them because they were dis the, it says the, in the Bible, it says they are dispirited and dis distressed like sheep without a shepherd. 
-hmm. then, it, and then it says, he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, plentiful, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers in his harvest field. And, and so the, the point I, I want to make from, from that is, is that I, I, I do think that God takes care of his people. And, and have believers died in this? Well, absolutely they have. But guess what? They ended up in heaven. And the believers who, who are sick now and, and they get through this, God's taking care of them. And so, like, I don't think we should fear illness or death. But, but I think what Jesus was getting at at the end of Matthew 9 here is that we shouldn't, we shouldn't see what we're going through as a tri tragedy only. We should see it as an opportunity. And that's what Jesus calls his people to, his disciples to. He says, man, I feel so bad for these people. My heart goes out to them. Pray to God that his people would be moved to action. And I would just say that, I would just say that to you. Like, even if you're mostly at home, you have family, you have friends, you have, you have neighbors um, that you can be loving during this time and using it as an opportunity and a tool uh, to, to minister. Yeah. Well, Do you guys have any additional about, thoughts on that? Yeah, I was thinking about the uh, the Israelites under the control of the of the Egyptians and uh, just the deaths that they had. You know, making straw, making uh, stone out of straw and stuff like that, being beaten and uh, suffering, and hardly any food to eat, so on and so forth. The whole thing, bottom line, is God delivered them mm -hmm. from that. And whatever yeah. we're going through with COVID-19 right now, God will deliver us from that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. That's really good. Um, here's, uh, here's the last question for tonight. We're at 817. So we've got a few minutes to finish. We've got a few minutes to finish this question and then we'll send you all off to a good night. Um, here's the question. So far, what are the big takeaways for believers that have come out of the pan? Uh, let me start that over. I don't know. I got tongue twisted. So far, what are the big takeaways for believers that have come out of the pandemic? Oh, man. I just think that, first of all, I think that we've all been so stunned by the epic effects that this virus has had on uh, just ourselves and our community, our country, and our whole world. And um, Right now, I feel like we're all living in this really uncomfortable place of uncertainty. Um, I think that with that being said, that if, you, if, there, if you're feeling um, depressed or scared or overwhelmed by anything, there's really absolutely no shame in that. But I really, really firmly, firmly believe that God wants to use this time, as Daniel was saying, to really establish us and to firm up our foundations. I was thinking about this scripture, I'm gonna read it. It's um, from Peter um, 5, chapter 5, 8 through 10. Stay alert, watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. Remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering you are. In his kindness, God called you to share in his eternal glory by means of Christ Jesus. So after you have suffered a little while, he will restore, support, and strengthen you, and he will place you on a firm foundation. And this um, theme of a firm foundation is just what I've really been thinking about, that, you know, Jesus said that that firm foundation is um, how we respond to his word and, you know, just saturating ourselves in, in the word and just um, allowing Jesus, the teachings of Jesus to, um, to shape every part of our lives. And, you know, I'll tell you what, God uses these, um, whatever crisis, at least in my life, to expose um, these kind of sh sandy foundations that that I in, inadvertently build my life upon. And we all do this at one time or another. Um, it's just part of our humanity, um, like the need for security or um, the well-being of our children, our health, our freedom, the need for, for perfection, a good retirement, 
I even put down the, um, the appearance of busyness to avoid um, God. You know, these are all um, sandy foundations that for each and every one of us, they're going to collapse eventually at one po point in our life. The only firm foundation is to build our life on Jesus. He's, he's our rock. And the thing is, is that he doesn't promise us that we're going to get through this life without suffering and without pain and without loss. Um, but you know what? Here's the thing that whatever the effects of this COVID-19 virus has on any one of us, um, that, you know, we can emerge from this in life. And I want to say also in death, um, completely unscathed that's the promise that we have if we just let our um, roots grow down into Jesus and if we build our life upon him and just um, I think that that's how he's been really using this time in my life is just kind of taking away all those false securities mm -hmm. I think that's the biggest takeaway and I think that if we can just allow this time to um, too, like the scripture said, firm up our foundations. I think that we're going to come out of this really strong. Yeah, really good word, Chrislyn. Thanks for sharing that. I've definitely been encouraging um, anyone I interact with in that same way that I, I think the Lord has given us this, this time as a refocusing and absolutely a refocusing on, on the firm foundation and and something that's been stirring in me, and I've been sharing this a little bit with some people who are close to me just in the last couple of days, but, you know, even when we get back to like normal church, if you will, like anticipate some changes because some things have happened in my heart that I'm looking forward to sharing. And I'll, and I'll just tease it a little bit. Like this time, though we get a little anxious about getting back to normal, this time has also been precious to remember and focus on what's most important, which I think is two things. I think it's faith and family. And so when we get back to church, I'm going to start asking questions about the importance of all the things we're doing. And, and if the things that we're doing aren't growing us in our faith and aren't growing us closer together as a family, then maybe we shouldn't be doing them. And my greater encouragement to the body in general, not just having to do with church is this like, man, don't immediately as soon as the light switch is flipped to bat the world is back on immediately fill your world again with busyness. Don't do it, man. Think about the precious time that you've had at home, even if you've been at times bored, even at times you've been anxious, like think of the precious time that you've had and fill it with things that really matter. And I'm going to tell you what matters. God matters and people matter and right. fill your time with those things and don't get right back to cluttering your life with the thousand and one other things that maybe didn't matter as much as we thought as, as we thought they did. And so I would say for me, that's the big takeaway is like, we don't have to be a culture that is so busy. We don't have to be a culture that is so tired and weary all the time. Mm -hmm. We can be a culture that is refreshed and focused on God and one another and, and cut off the fat of the other things. Oh, yeah. I love that, cutting off the fat of the other things. That's what it ends up being, just this um, cluttered life. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I don't want to go back to that. I don't think it's important that you escaped from COVID-19 or you came out of it. What you should be coming out of it was just a deeper relationship with your family, your wife, uh, with God, uh, that you made a, made a new commitment and you stay, you keep those commitments with God. And whether you read more or you're, you walk with them more, or you talk with them more, whatever the situation is, uh, you will find that relationship will feed you. Mm -hmm as you go forward. So mm -hmm. hopefully the negative turns into a positive based on the commitment that you've made to the Lord and to your, like with Crystal and I, yeah. you know, she, she made a comment one time that you need to have, get a hobby. Cause I don't know <laughs> what, when you retire, I don't know if I'm going to be able to stand having you around. <laughs> well, honest statement. And the other day she came out and said, you know, I enjoy being around you it's just it this isn't what i thought it would be yeah you know so i think those things you see these things happen you grow and you become 
closer with your family. Like you said, Daniel, you're closer with God. And if you aren't, some there's a whole bunch of airtime there that <laughs> wasn't filled. You yeah, know? I think too that, man, this is like a humbling experience because if anybody says they know exactly what they're talking about, they don't. This is mysterious yeah. still. We're still finding out so many things. Big time. And there's so many... Um, there's so many different opinions and oh my goodness, I talked to my kids and my one son is totally into the conspiracy theory. It sends me all this stuff and um, we talk about it and uh, we just don't know. And so I think that we just need to take a humble stance and not act like a know-it-all like some of the people do on the news. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate you guys sharing um, all, all of that. And uh, Chris Lynn and John, you guys were dynamite. I appreciate you guys doing this. You guys had, um, such, fab you had such fabulous stuff to share. Um, you'll definitely be doing it again. So I don't know <laughs> if that's good or bad for you. Oh, no problem. <laughs> but anyway, really appreciate what you guys shared. And we made it through all six questions in just the perfect amount of time. And I just want to end with this. Um, you know, what's coming next for Woodlands? Well, I've shared you know, a, a little bit about what we're thinking about for the future as far as gathering together again live. But, you know, what's next is what's next is Sunday. And I just want to invite all of you um, on Facebook Live to watch our to watch our service live. That's been going really well. If you're not on Facebook, you can always watch the recorded version later. But I'm just continuing with the story in the book of Exodus of God's people. And if you didn't hear me mention this last Sunday, I just want to mention it now. Um, if you felt like I started Genesis at church, um, a couple of months ago, and I skipped all of the rest of Genesis and jumped to Exodus. Um, we are going to go back to Genesis. I'm just teaching in Exodus during this time because I just feel like the story so aligns with what's happening to God's people right now. And that's why I'm teaching through that right now. But what's next is, is we're going to be talking about um, Israel becoming, the Israelites becoming impatient and and how god handles impatience and so if you're feeling impatient right now um, with what's going on with the world great story for you on sunday um from the book of from the book of exodus about patience and about god how god deals with impatient impatient people and so big story on sunday tune into facebook live or check your uh, email or uh, our website for the service uh, later in the morning so uh, that's what's next um we're gonna get out of here john would you just close us in prayer Absolutely. Thank you. Lord, we thank you so much for this opportunity to share and, uh, and to open up about your word and our lives and the situations that are going on, Lord. Nothing is absolute, only you. So, Lord, we just give you thanks. We give you praise and glory and honor for our lives and for our church and for our pastor and his wife, Lord. We ask that you continue to bless them and bless the church. Lord, and whatever your direction is, you'll make it clear to us. So uh, we look forward to Sunday. We look forward to being with you at church, Lord, and we just give you glory and honor forever and ever in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks, everybody. Love you, church. Can't wait to be back in person. I'll talk to you guys all soon. Okay, all right. bye. Bye.